All right, here we go. Let's get started. Um, so welcome everybody to Keystone Sessions. Uh, it's May 3rd, is that right? May 3rd. Um, I was gone last week, so I hope you all had fun without me. Uh, I missed you all uh, while I was out of town. I heard you guys did a great job, Jonathan and team. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I wanna start off by thanking those who make this possible. Children's Mercy Hospital, H&R uh, Block and Evergy uh, are gracious uh, sponsors of what we do here at Keystone Sessions in terms of bringing the community together and focusing on the various tracks that we try to integrate uh, audience uh, participation and audience collisions with. Um, so thank you for their support. Just want to make that clear. Um, and then also thank you to our neighbors down the road as we develop a, a neighborhood and a community here in the Keystone District. I want to thank the folks at City Barrel. Uh, who graciously dropped off even more beer for us tonight than we expected. Uh, the folks down at Border Brewing, if you haven't been following them on social media, you're missing out on some of the best social media entertainment going on on the web right now. And then our folks over here at Torn Label right behind us, uh, gracious uh, hosts, and they've been fantastic neighbors. So if you get a chance, head down there, try some of their beer, hang out. They're great places to meet people as well. Um, so we would encourage that. Um, tonight, we wanted to start things off. What we've been trying to do is focus not just on entrepreneurship, but focus on some of the, we'll call them emerging industries or industry opportunities, the emerging technology opportunities here in Kansas City. And so uh, I was, you know, months ago when I first heard about kind of what was going on with this group, was excited to hear that they were, you know, bringing resources together and bringing focus to this area. I think it's an important one. They'll talk about it here in a minute. Um, so that now that they've, now that they're out in public, now that they're out in the wild, um, we got them here uh, to come talk to us about kind of the work they're doing. I have a, a Maria's seen this once before. You haven't seen this yet, Dick. So I have an amazingly poor taste uh, a host habit of not introducing my guests. I make you guys introduce yourself. It's actually because I don't want to mess. Well, I don't want to mess it up. So I'm going to ask you guys, and we can start with Maria to just maybe give us an introduction. Who are you, and kind of what are you up to? And the lead in the You're lead live. into digital health, Casey. That, the whole, that whole uh, So Maria Flynn, I'm an entrepreneur in the pharmaceutical technology space. Um, Orbis Biosciences was my company. We sold it three years ago to Adair Pharma. So I made it to the other side and I've been working with entrepreneurs uh, since then. And um, I'm a Cerner alum. So I've been uh, watching the digital health space and have a lot of friends in, in that area. And you want me to keep going or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, keep going. Okay. So uh, when I was with Techstars, I went to an investor conference. It was a healthcare investor conference and somebody stood up and said, we invest in digital health. Uh, we have a Silicon X strategy. So outside of Silicon Valley, we like markets like Salt Lake City, Minneapolis, Nashville, Research Triangle Park. We just invested in Des Moines and I'm waiting for them to say Kansas City and they don't say it. And that's where I, I thought there's something interesting because we're a birth one of the birthplaces of, of that space and we weren't on their list. So I approached them and got to know them and I send them deal flow. And I said, you need to come to Kansas City and meet some of my friends. So they met people like Dick and I started to, you know, lay out everything that's here. And when they left, they said, you know, you have something special here. And it's somebody who had seen a lot of different cities and places. And so sometimes when it's from the outside, it means more than, you know, when you're here and they can see things that you can't see. So I'm on the board of BioNexus KC, which is an organization that catalyzes um, things that we need in the life sciences space and digital health is within that life sciences definition. So I approached them and said, hey, we have, a, we have a cluster here. We've got something special. We should be known for digital health and we're not. And they said, that's interesting. I don't know how we fit. And so we just started to explore it was about a year ago. Where could we take this? And I knew right away that the perfect leader was Dick Flanagan. Um, I knew Dick since 2003. So I called him up. It was one of my early conversations. And I'll hand it to him. Yeah, she did call me up out and she said, hey, I heard you might be leaving Cerner. I'm like, where did you hear that? I don't think I've announced that. We but, all know these things. Yeah, I know. Uh, she's a savant. Um, um, so... Hi everybody, I'm I'm Dick Flanagan. I am of our newly formed organization called Digital Health KC. I'm the CEO, 
and it is a big organization and you're looking at both of us, okay? Maria is head of the advisory board and she continues with her leadership role at Bionexus KC and uh, they are, if you will, our sponsoring organization. So I'll t we'll, we'll get into the details here in just a second, but um, I'm a Kansas City transplant, although been here for quite a while, I've been here 29 years. And I'm one of those people that, you know, come for a couple, stay for a lifetime, okay? And it's not because it's just a great place to raise a family. You know, you hear those things. That's usually uh, like a signal for like, oh, yeah, great. Do you know Overland Park was rated one of the best places to live? But who would want to visit there? Was I mean, it literally had that designation. So... So it sounds great for families, but that's crazy. This isn't just a great place for families. This is just a great place. And it's all the, the cities and the ecosystems on both sides of the state line. So I'm a transplant. I got attracted here because of this relatively small company called Cerner in 1994 with about 1,000 people and $100 million. And that sounds big to the companies that are starting here. But in the grand scheme of things, that was not a particularly, that, you know, wasn't a huge company. And to watch that company grow, and frankly, I did a bunch of the small acquisitions of acquiring companies like what Maria and her team would have put together at Orbis. Um, so I had a chance to deal with entrepreneurs and kind of, um, in a lot of ways, it's their dream come true to get acquired and to be able to take their product and have that but I, I'll, I'll tell you, I saw some really great examples where Cerner did that well and some where they kind of destroyed uh, the vision that, that that entrepreneur had built. So um, so I saw both sides of that and think I did a bunch of entrepreneurial stuff in my 28 years at Cerner, but I don't kid myself. Um, I, I don't get to go on stage and say I'm an entrepreneur, okay? I get to go on stage and say, I want to support the growth and the reputation of this region as the place to do digital health activity, digital health company supporting digital health. So we take all the ecosystem, and by the way, Kevin and Keystone, thank you guys for having us. Um, we rely heavily on the support of this community, both the philanthropic community. Over time, Marie and I hope to build out more of a membership model if we define things that are valuable, just like companies support Keystone. Um, you know, we're trying to build on Keystone build on KC Digital Drive, build on BioNexus KC. We are not trying to redefine space. We're not trying to redefine the work. We're trying to inject focus and attention on healthcare's biggest problems and what role information technology, digital technology will play in solving healthcare's biggest problems. So we're, we're a slice of industry focus against the broad ecosystem to support entrepreneur growth stage and frankly all companies in the region so i'm gonna do a little bit of storytelling just so you get a sense of how big this is and maria i want you to chime in here but um you know we put it in the note about how many companies are but when maria and i started this or she reached out to me how many companies maria did we think maybe were in the region what what number did we kind of just guess at my first list was about 18, and we're thinking like maybe double. Yeah, so we thought in the 30s, right? So we did the initial cut last summer, and we came up with about 50. And then we did some marketing out to the philanthropic organization, say, hey, can you give us some startup capital so that we can go out and do this properly? And we came up with 70. We announced that Digital Health KC is alive. We put out our website. We have Get on the Map. We are up to 90 companies. Now, would anybody have thought there were 90 early stage, growth stage, and big companies doing health IT or digital health in the greater Canada? I mean, it's almost, I mean, it's blown me away. And we haven't really been doing anything yet to encourage the growth. This is just what's here. So Maria, uh, through a contact that she had, was it um, through the Kauffman Foundation? So again, we're going to all these different places that support entrepreneur and growth and frankly, economic development. And they put us in touch with this guy, Bruce Katz, who's a professor at Drexel University in Philadelphia. And he's a, a Brookings fellow and he's done a lot of work with Kansas City. Okay, so Maria gave, gives her talk and she describes the first 10 minutes of a 35 minute call. And she says, here's what we think we have in Kansas City. And this guy is famous for helping to build out these ecosystems in cities. 
And he pauses for a second. He looks at us. It's on Zoom, of course. And he said, wow, seems to me that you have a cluster hidden in plain sight. And Marie and I then pause and we, you know, you can look at each other on Zoom. You know, we're like, that's it. Digital Health KC is a cluster hidden in plain sight. What's in a cluster? Well, it's things like Keystone, right? It's things like the Kauffman Foundation. It's, it's, it's all of the infrastructure and talent and ideas and capital and companies that create kind of a self-serving ecosystem that grows on its own and supports on its own. Well, today we've got all the makings of that, but when we talk to the companies and we say, hey, do you know about so-and-so? They all go, no, I don't know. They're like, well, they're actually doing about the same. They're not colliding. They're not interacting. Some of them, you know, they're all over the metro area and they didn't come through Keystone for the most part. Is anybody here doing digital health? Anybody here? Okay, oh, that's cool. Well, you're going to get a chance in a few minutes to tell us about it, so we're going to send the mic your way. But um, so anyway, what we're doing is this is an initiative to work within the infrastructure players here to shine a light on the companies and the talent that want to solve healthcare's biggest problems. And by the way, guys, healthcare's in trouble. Okay, so I can throw some facts and figures at you. So. Everybody in this room has had a healthcare experience. It may be a good experience and you've saved, it saved your life or it dealt with you at a period of high anxiety or injury and brought you back to health. But I'll bet you a whole bunch of folks in this room had a less than positive experience with healthcare, filling out clipboards, having to repeat yourself at every step along the healthcare journey. We would not put up with this in any other industry. And yet we put up with it every time we, oh, do you know how much stuff costs? You ever try to find out what stuff costs? I mean, some of you are not insured. Some of you may have gone on the Affordable Care Act, one of the plans. Some of you may have insurance. Yet you want to try to figure out how something costs. I mean, it's amazing. It's, it's almost unknowable. What the heck have we done to ourselves in this country? And yet we're, we're 18 point X percent of gross domestic product. If we were an econ if we were a country, healthcare would be the eighth largest country in the world. US healthcare. It's bigger than California. I mean, it's crazy how important this is because it's an industry that serves all of us, and yet how poorly it's administered and run. And you can talk about all the great organizations, but at the end of the day, it's not actually serving us really well. And it's a terrible value play. So I'm interested in hearing what you guys are doing to solve healthcare's biggest problems, but that's what we're up to, and that's probably enough of an introduction. And uh, I'm going to turn it back to Kevin. It's like the first time I've ever used a microphone. Um, thanks, Dick. It's uh, Maria. We know entrepreneurs, venture-backed companies, high-growth startups. We know that there are certain ingredients to their journey, certain steps of their journey that are consistent across industry, right? There are certain things that we can, in organizations like Pipeline that you're a member of and we're one of the original fellows of, um, they serve kind of the basic building blocks for all of these entrepreneurs and help them along the line. Help me understand what is it about uh, life sciences startup that might be unique when we talk about cluster support and we talk about the needs of the support for these organizations and and the benefits that something like digital health kc can provide to those startups that might be different than the basic building blocks of entrepreneurship that might be more industry specific what are those unique attributes or characteristics of a life sciences company or digital health company that that we might want to think about as we're thinking about digital health kc yeah, we'll stick to digital health because pharma is a totally different beast. And, um, and Dick's done a great job of surveying the entrepreneurial landscape of the resources that we have um, and what's missing for healthcare because I've been in it for a while that I, I need that perspective. And um, some of the things that are unique uh, to digital health are the payer how you're going to get paid. Your business model looks different than a lot of other industries. It's much more complex with the different, all the different stakeholders that you have to have move at the same time. So your provider, um, whether it's a hospital system or a physician group, your payer, if you're getting paid through insurance, 
your um, patient wanting it. So all that's what's complicated about this industry is all the different aspects versus, you know, the, the fact that we don't know how much things cost and we can make that decision. Um, and, and so the business models are different in this space. And a lot of times, um, you know, naivety can be good because we start, but then we can waste a lot of time. And that's what we want to do is how do we accelerate that learning from other people um, so that we can make more progress, progress faster. So the industry education, like the industry knowledge, the know-how, like some of those like pains and scars and checkpoints that they need to understand in terms of how those systems might work or what some of those, I don't want uh, I'll use the, the word regulation. I know that has a, it's a loaded term a lot in, in, especially in pharma and some of those other elements, but there's still certain regulations about privacy, HIPAA compliance, some of those things that they just, knowing those things up front, you can build better, like from the right. early stage. And getting early pilots is a lot harder in this industry than it might be in other, um, for other startups, because you're talking about really busy physicians and even just integrating with these big system, these, uh, you know, there's just a lot to do. You can't just get attention and this will just take a little bit of time. Yeah, we have a lot of, so we I had this long conversation last night with an individual about uh, the need for us as an ecosystem to better prepare our entrepreneurs to get out of ideation phase and get that first customer. Um, and there's, uh, you know, get that pilot, get that first customer, get that, you know, get that customer feedback. I think there was just an article, I wanna say it was in the star about Splitsy. I don't know if you guys saw that where he was talking about the failure of Splitsy and what he learned and, and his feedback was, I should have gone out and talked to customers first and earlier and gotten feedback on my concept. In this space, it's a little, it's muddled, right? It's not like to your point, the various places that you would get paid all kind of become customers in a way maybe, but there's also then the end user that's a, a certain kind of customer. So are those connections, how is Digital Health KC gonna help those startups, or is that an opportunity for you guys to help them make those connections either with early customers and early pilot opportunities and so on? Definitely, and, and the providers and the other, it, everybody is excited about not just the digital health companies, because if you go talk to um, the hospitals, a lot of their problems, they see digital helping fix some of those problems. They also feel the pain digital has created for them. So how do you, you know, get to the next step? And so one of the, things you see when you talk to them, talk to entrepreneurs is their first customer is often outside of Kansas City. And how do we make it easier within hometown to do some of these things? And we have enough of that ecosystem here. I think that's your point, right? Like they, they shouldn't have right. to leave Kansas City to get that first pilot, first customer, first opportunity, at least to get that feedback. But sometimes your first is just what, however you come upon it, you know, and sometimes it's just not here. So how do we make those pathways S seamless so that you know exactly which door to enter we can make it easy for easier for the provider can we um, give mentoring we've got a lot of talented people around here can we give mentoring so we're not wasting their time and um, kind of a st stamp of approval and and just make it more seamless of connecting the dots of which doors to enter sure um, so the corporate side Dick, I, I know the first time we had a conversation, the first time that you and I met and we talked about this on Zoom, there was some conversations about how do you get corporate engagement because, and I'd never heard this before until just now on this stage, Maria, but this as the birthplace or one of the birthplaces of digital health, I, it never, of course it is, like it never struck me though that that was the case. But we have other health IT, I mean, I don't want to call them all giants, but large yeah. companies that are in this health IT space that are in Kansas City. How do we get them engaged in helping the next generation? This is always a challenge, right? Because some of them see that as the disruption that they're afraid of. Some of them see that as too small to take a chance on. Like, I don't want to put, this was the problem at Sprint. There was a lot of services we didn't want to put in front of our customers. We had 30 million customers. Like, you can't put something that might fail in six months in front of people. So how do we get corporations yeah, I mean, engaged so, in this space? I mean, we're fortunate. So if you look at Oracle Cerner, while their footprint's changing and they're less of a, a talent importer that they had been for 40 years, uh, they're still a really important global player in health IT and digital health. Um, NetSmart and WellSky are both companies headed by former Cerner senior execs. And both have become really big companies in their space. One of the things that's probably not well known is that if you were gonna solve behavioral health, particularly community-based behavioral health, 
it turns out those three companies have the dominant solutions for community-based behavioral health. And it's all being done here in Kansas City. So that's pretty darn cool that those big corporations actually have, you know, some very particular expertise. Uh, but those are the companies that you tend to hear about because they own buildings and they have logos on buildings. And, and, and frankly, the talent pool that you have in this, this thousands of people that know healthcare really well, many of them have had stops in one of those three companies. And that is an important element for us because that's the talent pool from which we draw. Now, what the big companies worry about is you're just going to raid me for people. And the answer is maybe. I mean, that's part of a healthy ecosystem. And I don't think that's the major risk. The question you're, you're getting at is how do you get them more engaged? And some of it's going to be, frankly, through personal relationships, kind of shaming them into saying, come on, guys, you've benefited from this ecosystem and you're looking for innovation. This is a perfect time to support. Now, we'll see if that plays. OK, there's a couple. That's one of the value propositions we have to examine in this first you know, six months of, of our life as an organization. But um, I think, you know, Maria's point, this is a very complicated industry. It's got a very complicated payment mechanism. And the human body defies, in spite of everything you read about AI and all the stuff, we don't always behave like we're supposed to. And our bodies don't always react. And that's why healthcare, just solving the basic problems is tough. The companies that are in town that have figured it out and, you know, RX savings and, um, you know, we forget some of you, if you've been around a while, there's companies like Cactus Software, Perceptive Software, um, Argus, uh, Script Pro. I mean, there are other names, Geo Access, if you really want to go back in a blast from the past. These were all companies based in Kansas City because, frankly, we are one of the core centers of what it is to solve healthcare's problems through IT. So it's not just Cerner. That's actually one of the messages we have to take around. It's not just Oracle Cerner. Um, so I think we got a shot at getting them engaged. Uh, some of it will be relationships, but it's also that we're providing value. Gotcha, gotcha. Were you gonna add something? Yeah, one of my memories from Cerner is whenever you would um, have a new partner in town, so a sales relationship. Um, the first slide was about Cerner, and the second slide was always about Kansas City. And you did a lot of work of why we're here and and all the great things are here. And what and if you're just one company, you have to do that. But when you have 90 companies and you, you have this really mass concentration, we shouldn't have to do that. So like the number one thing that's a benefit for all these people, it's, it's pride. It's something unique that nobody really has if we can, if we can nurture this right. Um, and it should make uh, doing business much easier because we don't have to sell while we're here, why we're here. People come here. You don't have to sell why you want to move here if you're hiring, things like that. And it's, you know, similar to the Animal Health Corridor, when you go to their annual event, you see people from Tokyo and Brazil and Australia, and they come here because they know what we have here. And yeah. that's really what we're trying to do. Yeah, no, that's extremely helpful. And I, you know, I have vivid memories of walking into hotels all over the country, checking in and having them be, are you here for business? Yeah, who do you work for? Sprint. Oh, where do you live? Kansas City. Oh, I didn't know Sprint was there. And you're like, Cerner, Garmin, Hallmark, H&R Block, you, and they're like, I had no idea. And um, with Animal Health Corridor and now with KC Global Design, you have that marketing beacon that is starting to put that out there. Um, our experience, and I say our experience, a lot of the, I think, programming entities experience has been that that marketing without the substance behind it, the infrastructure, as Dick was referencing, um, becomes kind of a, a you have to live up to a promise when you market yourself as a cluster because there's other things that go with that. Have you all thought about the programming side of this and, and like what that looks like? Is that are there like Keystone, like there are already other programs that exist that you can bring in and just like recognize under the umbrella. Are there new programs that you think need to be put in place to support digital health entrepreneurs? Yeah, I'll take a first cut at it. So um so we were chatting with Jonathan there about, you know, some early education you're trying to do and bringing teams together and, and ideate. One of the things we want to do programmatically is to look at the other activities supporting early and growth stage companies uh, is when someone raises their hand and says, hey, I'm a healthcare guy. I'm trying to do something in healthcare. What we immediately want to do is kind of assess and assist and get them lined up with people that know healthcare well. 
or people that if you're going into the payer space, you know, trying to get them if they've been unable to get into Blue Cross here, because that's one of the weaknesses we have. We don't have a big payer network, but we have a lot. You know, we have three medical schools in Kansas City. We have, I did the count today, we have 17 schools of nursing and another 14 allied health programs. I mean, we have an incredible infrastructure across the universities here. Um, and that's really an important part of where you can find some of that talent. So number one, to inject talent mentorship early in these companies to assess. Secondly, what we heard from the entrepreneurs that we've done the early stage, you know, kind of focus, I mean, the, not focus groups, but just interviews, they said like, God, this is so freaking lonely. You know, it's why a, a co-working space and a place you can come and meet up with people is so important. But they want to meet people like them working in healthcare. Um, and they want like, the other thing we've heard is my tech needs to scale for healthcare. And there's a lot of stuff that are healthcare requirements. You mentioned them on the regulatory side, but there's also on the infrastructure, you know, SOM2 and SOC2, excuse me, high tech stuff and TEFCA. And these things probably don't mean much to most of you in the room, but they're actually very particular to healthcare and they need a tech sense. So we want to bring that to the table. Privacy is different than you find in other industries. We want to bring that to say, hey, if you're designing your business model and your data collection and your data storage, you got to follow this different set of rules than you would have under normal cloud or high trust or some of the other you know frameworks. So what we're trying to do is you think about support them in the early stage, support with the mentoring and the healthcare, healthcare specific, and then frankly, on the tech side, getting them assistance to understand there's some pretty pretty challenging tech tech uh, situations. Dick, you you brought up uh, since you brought it up, I'm going to dive in on it. Uh, talent fluidity within a, an ecosystem. When you look at healthy entrepreneurial ecosystems outside of Kansas City, you see a lot of talent fluidity. You see people moving between companies. You know, there's a big push right now to get away from non competes. There's a lot of you know downward pressure. Uh, from organizations to say, hey, these things really shouldn't be in place because it it prevents that talent fluidity. Um, and as a as someone who's been on the other side of that, in in both instances, when we started the Sprint Accelerator, I did get yelled at by Cerner of like, hey, why are you guys doing a healthcare accelerator? They're going to steal our employees. But I also got Sprint executives that were saying like, hey, we run a risk by parading in front of all these startups that our people are going to want to go work for them. Um, and, and one of the things that we learned was every time one of your employees leaves and goes and gets experience, there's a decent likelihood they might come back and or their experience over there. They're going to if you've been good to them, they're going to tell people about what their experience was working for your company and that kind of thing. How do we get companies to get over this fear of talent fluidity and this fear of losing employees? Isn't it better if they stay in Kansas City? Versus if, if they do leave that company, chances are, if we don't have this yeah, kind so of ecosystem, me, they're going to leave, right? Maria, I want you to um, chime in on this here in a second. But here, here's a couple of the interesting facts. So one of the first things we have to do is really document the ecosystem. So you hear things like 90 companies and 25,000 people, and, and that those are you know reasonably accurate, okay? <laughs> they're the kind of things we would promote and present. But we have work to do to really understand where these companies fit, the stage they're at, where they are in capital, you know, formation and all those things. But what what is really interesting about the talent side of this, so there's a talent diaspora that has gone on, not just starting with COVID, but so many of the people with health IT talent that worked at these companies now work at companies outside of Kansas City. So we put them at a couple of levels. So the win-win-win for us is KC talent working in health IT, working on a KC company. So that's the three things we'd like to see. But we see a whole lot of talent that's still doing health IT, but they're doing it in all the companies around the country. You know, health IT has been one of the most heavily funded things in the run up through, you know, 18, 19 through 22. But if they live here, that's still great. Lived here is great. It's great payroll of one person. And we maintain the talent. Now, here's what's interesting. I went to the big, two big trade shows over the last, you know, few months. And I started taking pictures of all my KC buddies with their badge, which said Kansas City, Missouri, simpler. Kansas City, Missouri, and you know the various companies that they're around. 
And the really cool thing is, I told him what we were doing. Only one person, and I mean out of the, this is, this is a sample size of around 30. They all said, are there companies in Kansas City that I could, I would really like to work for a Kansas City company. I said, stay tuned. They want to come. They don't want to get on planes. They don't want to Zoom commute every day. They'd like to come and hang out with their friends and neighbors. So I think that's a, um, so we identified that. And then a whole bunch of people have left the industry and they, I think we can get them back because look, there are a lot of cool things you guys are working on. I've spent most of my, you know, I've spent over 31 or 32 years doing health IT stuff. And it, it's a noble calling. It's freaking hard. But at the end of the day, you're doing really good things for people in society. So it's pretty easy to grab your heartstrings and pull you into this industry. And people like it. And when they leave it, honestly, they want to get back because they want to do good. They want to see things improve for everybody. So Maria, what, what's your observation? Well, I think we are in that moment at a time where there is a lot of people that aren't in those big companies that we can just like Dick's saying. And then in a few years after we've built that this is the place to do it, then you're going to attract more people and it's it's going to be a rising tide lifts all boats. And then you just have to be the best place for people to come work. And that's um, that's a good goal for all of us. Yeah, I think as an ecosystem that's attainable, um, I think the barrier that I'm I'm trying to get to is that the, the without corporate support for any of these you know, I, I think of the Animal Health Corridor, KC Global Design as the as the comps right in the space, or even the architectural. You know, the the earlier architectural or design entities that existed before KC Global Design, they had to have the big companies kind of back them financially because a lot of them are nonprofits that are ecosystem builders, like what we're doing here. Getting them engaged, that fear of I'm going to lose people is like one of those big hurdles that sits in the way of whoever those check writers or those decision makers have been. So I, I can't wait to see how the shaming works, especially from someone like you who's wow. sat on the, you know, like sat at their, their table. I will say there will be CFOs that you'll run into or there'll be yeah, HR I people mean, that you'll I, run into I, that I mean, will Kevin, say I, I, we're going to yeah. we're going to run into the talent issue. Yeah, we're we're going to run into it. But here's the interesting thing. When you're the only company in town and you're trying to recruit people to town. They're like, what happens if it doesn't work out? I mean, in 94, when I came to Cerner, I'm like, I mean, that's a big move for my family from Baltimore. I had four kids, four small kids. And it's like, man, if this doesn't work out, I'm kind of screwed. And that was the prevailing. But there was this overwhelming sense that this was the time to make the move, the time to take the risk. And healthcare was really important to me. And I wanted to change the world. So it helps when you know, this is another observation. You know, when I started my career at IBM, if someone showed up with a resume at age 40 and had been to six different companies, I'm like, what's wrong with you, dude? Can't you hold a job? Right? If people come at age 40 and haven't worked at six companies, like, what's wrong with you? Why have you only been, been at the same company? Right? So there's a big change in how people view. And I don't think companies, you know, there's no more of this employment for life. And what we heard from, actually, talk about what Wendy's looking for at NetSmart and some of the view, why they, why talent is so important to them. And I think that's the angle, but maybe you can talk a little. Okay, keep going. Okay. So look, so um, when we talk to the HR leads, um, you know, they want the ecosystem to produce homegrown talent, right? And as people grow in their career, the NetSmarts and the WellSkies and the Oracle Cerners and the rest of these companies need, frankly, people that have, in some cases, more complex and more developed skill sets. Some of that comes from early stage companies that are maybe dealing with a smaller you know, subset of problems. And in other cases, they need to inject the kind of energy that people that have worked in smaller companies and the innovative mindset. They want to re-inject that back into the corporate culture. So I think the ecosystem is, you know, what Cerner did that was unique they were a massive importer of college graduate talent going around the surrounding states, bringing people in, and most of those young people stayed in Kansas City. They were very good at various times of importing people like me, mid-career people that would come in. And you know what? Most of us stayed. And most of us are still doing stuff in health IT. So what we have to convince those companies is that a vibrant ecosystem of training, development, going into the company, and as you talked about, out. I mean, 
I'm sure at Sprint they're like, well, how many of them are going to come back? Well, the reality of it is people are coming back and going. This is a very different employment environment than it was when most of the executives grew up in it. And some of it's just a little bit of reality check to say they're not staying for 10 years. Okay. If you can get three to five years out of somebody, that's a huge win at this point. Are you um, in a position, you think, with Digital Health KC to help some of these companies understand? Uh, because I see this gap between there's people looking for innovation economy jobs, I'll call them innovation economy opportunities, what we call thriving wage. There are workforce development programs. We have several of them that are in this building with us, Launch Code, Goodwill, uh, you know, VFA, I, uh, Black Excellence Inc. Um, and then you have the employers that's like, we can't find enough people for these jobs that we have. You know, I hear the tech council talk about there's always 4,000, 4,500 open tech jobs in Kansas City at any moment in time. But then you go talk to the workforce development organizations again, and they're like, we're having trouble getting people in seats. And it's because some of the employers won't accept the non-degree based pathways and so on. Do you guys feel like you're in a position to help that that pathway conversation for digital health companies as well from a talent perspective? Is that the role of an ecosystem like Digital Health KC? I mean, yeah, it, so when we talk to, to Enterprise KC, which Cliff Illig is leading and has some Department of Commerce funding to think about what are those clusters up and down and what does it take to build, the number one thing on these lists is talent and workforce development. When we met with Kaufman, the number one thing they're trying to do with real world learning, and as you know, not everybody's going to pursue a college degree and not everybody in tech is going to go, you know, the master's in computer science before they're going to get a, a job in a tech firm. And it turns out digital health, the digital side of this equation, um, people are coming into that space with very different um, educational backgrounds. But not that we don't, I'm on the board of a couple of colleges and, you know, we're the, the colleges are morphing. There's a big... This is the other workforce challenge, folks. Um, we, if we keep doing things like we've done, expecting college-seeking students to fuel the workforce development, we're in big trouble for two reasons. One, there's a demographic trough starting in 26 through 31 or 32. So there's just far less people that are going to be traditional college seekers. And if we don't find ways to get people back into workforce training initiatives, whether they miss the college experience or they had no intention of getting a college experience, we have to rethink how we get folks trained. Companies also have to be willing to do the training. Companies have to be willing to invest and to be willing to put people through boot camps and other aspects. And then, you know, maybe, you know, doing a little bit of like, you got to stick with us for a couple of years or something if we're going to pay for the training. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if that works or not in the long run, but those are the things that are going to have to change. So what do we think we do? We're trying to get the lens because I said there's the digital side and then there's the healthcare side. The healthcare side in Kansas City for healthcare training is vibrant. I mentioned the three medical schools, the nursing schools, the PTOT speech, and all of the professional degrees that surround medical technology and the like. We're, we're doing a decent job of producing those, you know, those types of, of talent. But how do we get that talent both on the health and the digital side into the ecosystem of digital health. And I, I don't know that we've solved that yet. That's, yeah. that's the kind of thing we're going to work you're on. You're brand new. You're brand new. We'll give you some time to figure that one out, Dick. I, I promise. Um, I, I would end on the workforce development conversation to help out my brothers and sisters on the next panel that we're going to be talking about workforce development. Um, but I, I have to talk about capital. So access to capital. When we think about the three kind of needs of the entrepreneur, access to talent, access to resources, the connections, mentoring, the things we talked about, industry expertise, those types of things. But without the access to capital conversation, I feel like we fall short. What role will Digital Health KC have in, one, maybe attracting, because we know not all VCs do the same thing. And that's one of the challenges that entrepreneurs have to understand is maybe those that are focusing on digital health in Kansas City, maybe there's only a handful of them today. Maybe that doesn't line up to the 90 companies. And I think that's what we hear. What role do you have or could you have in helping attract capital to the market or helping grow new investment arms or new investment entities, uh, institutional investors or otherwise that are focused on the digital health space? So that's a big area of focus for us of how do we connect the, the dots and not all the investors have to be local. 
So how do we build the network? And people from outside are coming in, they're coming to our launch celebration next week, and they're excited to see what's here and, and know that this, they can smell that this is a ripe place that they wanna be first in line. So uh, we've already started building those relationships and sending deal flow to different places. We need to um, um, invigorate our angel um, uh, community and, and we're not going to do that alone. Let's so, talk. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so how do we, I think there's some really creative things other parts of the country are doing that we can do here and how do we um, make that more vibrant? Um, that's one of the things that looking back to tech stars and when they built out Boulder, one of the things that they would, one of their mantras was pick a company, write a check, pick a company, write a check. So I think that there's some, there's some shifts we need to do at the earliest stages. Um, to get them on the on the path, and then we've had some really good conversations recently with investors here that aren't in this space. But could we help enable them? Maybe help find the right professional to to inject in there um, to get more of that sophistication. And because you you have you have it in the mentors, mm -hmm. um, and your and what one of the things I'm uh, delighted to see is uh, uh, people with a lot of deep experience and deep networks putting their arm around small companies and and. Ushering, ushering them forward, which to me is new. So we've got a lot of those great people around town. If we have more of that, um, I'm excited about what this could become uh, from an investor and mentoring and just helping them on the pathway. It, it might seem, um, I think, self-apparent to someone who's done kind of this kind of work before, but I, I, I do want to put a, a point to, by creating a cluster and creating the focus, the tendency for institutional money to want to invest in one of those companies and pull it out goes away because they, they have the support they need here. They know the investors know. So the money can come in here safely or feel like they've de-risked that long term or that long distance investment that some VCs are a little bit more reluctant to make because an organization like this exists. Is that? Yeah, I, I, I think that's very well said. Part of what we're hearing. So, so the gap is this early stage, the seed, the pre series A capital is very difficult for companies in this space, in this region to get, particularly now. So by creating a cluster showcasing more than the 15 or 20 companies that may hit the radar, one, we're making it a better place for an investor to stop because they're looking for time efficiency. And we're also trying to de-risk some of those investments by helping those companies that maybe really aren't great ideas. And that's the, the having a little bit of edginess but to try to say, hey, when you come here as an investor and we showcase these companies, they've got mentorship, they've, they're on the right path, they've got you know product market fit, they've done a lot of those early stage things. So I know we're at time, can I make one, I, this is an important piece that we've kind of missed here. Digital health can either accentuate the strengths of the current US healthcare system, or it can um, accentuate the weaknesses. And one of the weaknesses of our system, it's not particularly equitable. And so one of the things we also have an eye on is when we're building solutions and we're using databases to make decisions and we're thinking about algorithms and use of AI. One of the big partners here is the Center for Practical Bioethics and the Ethical Use of AI work group. Because what we want to ensure is that when you come to a KC company, these guys have been through that filter that the data we're using, the algorithms we build, the problems we're trying to solve, aren't going after the one or 2% of people with money that buy the stuff, whether it's good or bad. And we really think about serving all uh, members of our community in as equal and as equitable way as we possibly can. So we do not want to make the digital health divide worse. And I think that can be a really important attribute of what we're doing here in Kansas City. I think, uh, Dick, that's one of the reasons that I, I wanted to like harp in on the the talent piece, because if you don't have people that represent those communities working in those companies, that's that's uh, going to be a pipe dream. Uh, if you don't have investors that, in, you know, angels in particular invest in things they know, invest in things they recognize. And that's not just digital health. If we want to support those founders of color that have those lived experiences in this digital health, like this problem, this huge problem gap we have, we need to be promoting those, you know placing even in some instances those founders of color into those instances and so i would encourage you guys you know, keep 
keep reaching out into the community, keep understanding how we can continue to push that equity lens on, on everything you guys are doing. I think it's wonderful um, that the organization is here. I think it's needed. I think it's funny that you, you're only going to get to use the tagline so long that it's a cluster hiding in plain sight. Cause I think you guys have already done well, away the with other that tagline now. is connecting ideas to talent, talent to capital, capital to companies, companies to the market or to customers. That's the one that will probably, hopefully we can last, <laughs> last. but it is a cluster hidden in plain sight for now. But uh, the first blog entry is hidden in plain sight. No more. Yeah. No longer. Yeah. Yeah. Fair, fair, fair. Uh, so last thing, um, what can, the, how can people engage with digital health KC? So people in the room, people who have a startup idea, people who are wanting to learn more about what you do, like how can they learn more? How can they engage with the organization? I know there's just, yeah, it's, it's funny when this is a two person organization, you're both pointing at each other. That's well, I mean, cause Maria's, I mean, I'm, I'm responsible for Maria's will. I mean, she has been the organizer from the beginning, but we are in this transition to her being the advisory board chair and building the advisory board and and me carrying the the kind of the day to day banner. Um, so what what so what kind of things do can this group do? How, how can people how can the community at yeah, large, so, whether it's the people in this room, people on, behind the camera, like how can people engage with? Well, number one is this we call get on the map. If you're working in digital health, we need to know about you. So on, on our, you know, KC, uh, digital health, KC dot org. Um, we're inviting people to self-identify. Um, we do have a kickoff event next week, and I, I can tell you we're oversubscribed, which is a hint that this thing is actually a pretty, pretty hot sector. We're trying to clear a wait list and get involved there. But what you'll see coming out, if we can, we are will be proactively finding these companies, and people are finding us. Surprisingly, I mean, I've never used LinkedIn so much in my life, but LinkedIn has become an incredibly important source and frankly, a, a connector. But, you know, email is pretty simple. Dick at digitalhealthkc.org and Maria at digitalhealthkc. And I was the Dick at Cerner for a long time. And I really miss my Dick email. So, um, and since it's my name, I get to make the jokes. Okay. So we might need to edit some of this. No, Z you don't. Just, we might need to edit some of this. I have been going this. through this for, Let's you know, 25 years so on the, my email. The, so the, anyway. The Dick from Cerner is now the Dick in charge of exactly. Digital Exactly. Yeah, I got it. And see, it, you it. will not forget the email because it's yeah. Dick at Digital Health kc.org probably remember and in I am, the middle of the night yeah, exactly rough um, so i don't hand out business cards i just you know <laughs> oh yeah so see I, you know what's great about this someone when i bring this up is always blushing other than me <laughs> yeah it's, it's i can feel it right um <laughs> We were actually talking about your social media earlier. Darcy Howe and I were actually referencing the fact that I've never seen you post on social media until you answered the post that we put out about this. And that was encouraged to see that you're actually progressing, Dick. So fantastic. Um, thank you both for being here. Um, hey, thanks for the opportunity, guys. I, I really want uh, to, you know, we've done this a few times. Uh, our one year anniversary of sessions is coming up on June 7th. We're not going to do three sessions. We're going to have just a party and we're going to invite all the former speakers back. So we'd love to have you guys back then to participate in that since you're in this first year. But I do want to invite you guys back as you progress, like six months from now. I'd love to hear about the progress, hear about the you know the challenges, and let's be transparent. I I can't wait to hear you stop talking about the, um, telling the truth as being edgy. I think we just need to tell our entrepreneurs the truth and call it that. Um, and so I, I'd love to have you guys back in points of time and talk about and, the, and look, the progress. We need the help. So this is not a big organization. <laughs> this is the talent pool you're seeing. Um, and we have got great sponsorship by BioNexus KC, which allows us to kind of get this started with, with zero funding when we started. So we're doing what you guys have to do. We have startup capital, and then we got to create a business model. Yep. And, um, and as Kevin's pointed out, that might be tougher than we think, but we'll see. I mean, what the hell? It's a great idea. We know entrepreneurs need the help and healthcare's got a lot of problems that need to get fixed and we want the help. So if your idea doesn't work out, the whatever idea you have, Think about healthcare. I mean, it's a big freaking market, guys. So anyway, I'll just throw that out there too. Absolutely. Thanks everybody. Uh, yeah, Appreciate thanks it. Appreciate it.